forward. So it's, I just recently finished my PhD. Um, in fact, I only finished it about three weeks ago. Um, and the last couple of weeks have been a whirlwind. I defended uh, August 8th and then I ended up hopping on a plane to Thailand. Um, some of you that are coming in a little bit later, I was on Team Canada for dragon boat racing. Um, and so I raced in Thailand and actually came back um, about 11 hours ago. So I'm uh, still technically in Thailand time. So for those that are up really early, I completely understand. It feels like the middle of the night for me. So um, anyway, so my topic that I was asked to bring forward is on this topic of dimension wayfinding. There's different ways that we always like to talk about it. I like to use wayfinding because it doesn't have that stigma attached to it. But there are some times you're going to end up hearing from me a terminology of wandering. And I'm going to be having a little bit of a conversation on that because I know there's quite a bit of stigma discussion in the dementia community on that field. And then more specifically, I'm going to be speaking on this consortium that I co-founded um, almost two, two years ago and kind of where it's at and where we're going in this field. Um, I know that this is a very sensitive topic, so what I've done is pretty much I have about 22 slides. I don't plan on speaking for the whole hour, but because this is a, a sensitive area, I would love to be able to even ask generating a conversation around this because it's we know it's an issue and it's, sometimes we have to talk about it. Um, so feel free, um, I'll, once I've done the conversation or once I've done the presentation itself, then we can kind of open it up and talk about the consortium or even anything else around this field. So before I get started on that, um, so this is the slide of Dragon Boat. If you don't know what Dragon Boat is, uh, these are the pictures that I was able to quickly pull up from Facebook that people added me on. Um, so essentially I was on the women's national team and on the mixed national team. Um, Potato Thailand was beautiful, it was hot. Um, our team did quite well. Um, Canada, we're one of the only amateur teams um, in the world. We're up against China, Thailand, USA, and they all have salaries and are paid to do this. Um, and despite our, our odds of paying to go all the way over there and do this, our women's team actually won three of the four events, won the Women's Cup, and actually broke a world record. So kind of coming on a high, coming back from that trip. Um, and for if you want to see me in action, if you end up looking on the screen, if you look on the bottom right-hand corner, the second person is me. <laughs> if you can take a quick little peek, it's just kind of me going as hard as I can. So, <laughs> um, so now moving on to the topic itself. Um, so I always like to use this slide just to kind of bring into speed the topic that I've been trying to tackle over the last four years and is in fact turning into my research career and my research program. Um, and so the reason why I like to use this slide is because simply just to demonstrate that this is unfortunately it's becoming an issue worldwide. All you have to do is go onto Google and look up lost older adult or lost person with dementia and you're going to come across hundreds of thousands of these news articles and these are only a select few because I know that many of them aren't reported to the media. And so with this, um, there's a stat that they end up using through the Alzheimer's Association. And they say that three in five persons with dementia will wander. I'm sure many of you heard that term. And again, I'll discuss that a little bit later on, but it's pretty much people end up saying that it is becoming more common with those with dementia of having a risk of getting lost in their community. And essentially the downfalls of getting lost um, range from minor injuries, high search and rescue costs, and even death. And some seniors, such as the case of Shin No, that you can see on this slide here, um, who became become lost. In fact, he was lost in 2013. They have yet to find him. Um, so this really begins to raise concern as to how we can start to address this issue. Um, and then in addition to this, um, there's also, in terms of the increasing prevalence, there's been a lot of different talks as to how we need to be able to deal with this issue. The first thing that comes to most of the people's minds that really contributes to this stigma and this fear of this issue is locked dementia units. Um, many persons with dementia that I've involved in my work throughout my PhD and even speaking to care partners, a lot of cases people delay their diagnosis because they think they're going to get locked up. Um, there's, this, there's this fear of this happening to them. And unfortunately, there's many other different types of strategies that are coming out that are promoting the autonomy and this balance between independence and safety of the person. However, we haven't really been talking about that as much. Um, and a perfect example of alternative strategies, and I'm sure many of you from around the world have been hearing more of these talks of silver alert systems. Um, in Canada, it's again, it's tons of different news articles on that where people have been pushing for having some form of a silver alert system. 
an older adult or a person with dementia has gone lost in their community, can we alert the public to try to find the person as soon as possible? And the lovely Ron Bellino that's online, I was actually a part of a project with him over the last couple of years with CASAP that focused on developing some kind of system to try to find them involved in the community. Um, and then, in fact, in Canada, there was actually a national petition for trying to have that. There's been different legislations that's been going on. So obviously, there's a need that's going on with trying to address this issue and getting away from locked dementia units and using the community. So with this context being said, so now moving on to really the consortium, um, starting off with that and kind of how it all started. So. I always love to share this story um, because it ended up starting on Twitter. Um, I myself was not really an active Twitter user, um, which back in 2016, I barely used it, I had an account. And Roger Marple, that I'm sure many of you know, who's a person living with dementia in Alberta, he, uh, when I met him for the first time, he told me I needed to become more active on my Twitter account. So I listened to Roger and then who would have thought that um, as I started to share some of my work, I became introduced to another PhD student out of the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, and her name is Katie Gambier-Ross. And pretty much from learning from what she was done, and again, Ron Bellino being that lovely connector, um, back in January of 2018, we had a Zoom conversation, and we really started to talk about what was going on in our fields. Katie was doing work looking at different aspects of wayfinding and how persons with dementia experience it. And then I myself was curious, coming within an occupational therapy background, as to looking at these different proactive strategies we can use. And through this conversation that I had with her and having Ron on the other, on the other end, we really began to learn that none of us as young researchers, specifically within this field, are talking to each other. And then even more so, persons living with dementia, police, community organizations, and health authorities, they're not speaking to each other as well. So really we're working in our individual silos and nothing is being done and we're almost repeating the wheel over and over again. A perfect example was that my guidelines that I was developing for my thesis, I had actually learned that at Alzheimer's Society in Calgary, Alberta, they were planning on doing something that was similar. So it was happening in the same province and I told them, well, instead of us creating two different guidelines, we need to work together and to be able to develop something that was that much stronger. So when Katie and I were sharing these different experiences, we really learned some kind of knowledge platform, something needed to be done. So all of us from all different stakeholder groups can start to talk about this issue and really start to figure out how we can start to change it. Because from where I was sitting, at least within Canada, not a lot of movement was happening. and The locked dementia units were still very much ingrained in everyone's minds. So within the consortium itself, um, pretty much after we co-founded it, we ended up following a little bit of a Germany after the Zoom conversation where we actually had learned that there was a past research consortium in the United States. Um, a lot of our research on this term wandering um, came from Dr. Donna Algaze, and this group kind of died off about 10 years ago and nothing had happened. Then luckily when I was, uh, I tend to travel a lot for Dragon Boat, so when I was in Tampa, Florida, I met with one of the founding members of that group and receive permission to be able to revamp it, change it to our ideologies, and let Katie and I start to take the wing of it. So in terms of the consortium, kind of how it is, um, it's really has served as a knowledge exchange platform, really, again, for all of us different stakeholder groups, really making sure, again, the person with dementia, their voices are especially heard of. Um, we're being, beginning to talk about this issue, being able to address it from an international perspective and getting away from our individual silos. And so this slide just simply depicts that it's not just the person with dementia, though, that we want to include, because within this area it involves more than just them. The police have been highly impacted by this issue. Health professionals have. Community organizations, Alzheimer's societies, are getting so many questions on persons with dementia that do get lost, and they have no idea what to do. And so really, if what Katie and I had discussed is if we really want to be able to move the field forward, we needed to involve everyone as much as possible. Our last one, though, that it's, it becomes a little bit more of a struggle is to be able to involve policy um, as well as governments. Within Canada, I've been blessed that um, within the Alberta, uh, province of Alberta, they've been starting to become involved and interest in the consortium. However, that's something that Katie and I need to continue to look at. It's involving governments from around the world. So in terms of where we are at right now, again, this group is very young. Again, it started with a conversation in January 2018, and really, we have a hard time conceptualizing when the consortium actually became it. Um, we ended up saying about uh, September of 2018 was when it started, so it's only been about a year old. 
Um, but even though it's only been around for about 12 months, we have about eight countries that are involved and it is growing. Um, of course, as you can see on this slide here, North America, we have different aspects of Europe. And then we have one group um, from, her name is Dr. Margie, Margie McAndrew, which I'm sure Kate, you might know of. Um, Margie is a part of that. Um, however, Asia, we haven't covered yet. So we know that there's a lot more work that needs to be done because this is definitely a global issue. And other than just involving first world countries, um, we have come to learn that there are the same issue that's happening in some of the second world countries. So we really need to try to become a global group. And that's something that we're starting to push for. So for the current consortium members though, and again, this is, uh, it doesn't have everyone, but this just really shows that this is a really diverse group, which is quite exciting. I wasn't expecting it. Um, where I ended up starting off with this little conversation and we have universities from multiple areas. We have different Alzheimer's societies that become involved. We have Dementia Connections, um, which is a magazine from Calgary. We have multiple police organizations. So it's, it's a good solid group and even members of industry. Um, and this number is only continuing to grow as we're beginning to reach out um, to more organizations and seeing who wants to become involved in this. And really the consortium has become super, super flexible for people because we really are aware that people are, live very busy lives. Um, so pretty much as long as anyone was interested in this area, whether they wanted to go to some of the symposiums we were about to host, or they wanted to voice their opinion, their idea, that kind of became that piece. Um, and I'm gonna explain it in the next couple slides as to how people have been starting to get involved. So the consortium goal, so really, um, this again was only formed uh, not too long ago um, in March after our first in-person meeting, but really the goal of the consortium is to help people living with dementia go out and about safely in their local neighborhoods without fear of stigma of getting lost or going missing. That's a really key piece is getting rid of that stigma and giving them the feeling that they can still go out into their community. And then also um, what we end up having here is um, that we plan to do this by doing research and sharing best practices from around the world. I find that having world audiences is, is, incredib is incredibly beneficial. What's going on in the UK, maybe us in Canada can learn something from them. And even vice versa, can we learn from another country and start to implement it? Really, we felt that there was a huge strength in involving that. And we really felt that by being able to do this kind of work, uh, these measures can help people live their lives safely. And again, really focusing on without restricting freedom. How do we let people live the lives they want to live without the fear of getting locked up? So pretty much the way that we had initially started, we had preliminary Zoom meetings, but of course it's, it's only as important until you get to meet people in person. So um, fortunately we received funding through a group that I've been a part of um, and they're called Age Well. So it's Technologies for Aging Well. Um, and as well as there was another group that Katie and her supervisor were able to get um, through eCred out of the University of Edinburgh. And essentially the money ended up covering Katie and her supervisor to fly all the way from Edinburgh to come to Calgary, um, Alberta. And we also had a couple police um, officers from Ottawa. We had some of the community organizations. We see Roger Marple in the bottom left hand corner. Um, and then among others, and really this was the preliminary piece of figuring out what are we, what are we capable of doing? And something that we've been trying to explore, and it's still a little bit of a struggle, is because this is an international consortium, and I'm sure Kate and everyone that's a part of um, a part of Die um, are aware of that. Trying to involve everyone is difficult, so we had Zoom conversations that were embedded, so if people couldn't be there in person, they can join in by Zoom. But of course, that meant that people had to be awake at all hours of the day. Um, but it was cool though because we were able to share what the researchers were doing and really starting to figure out kind of what are the gaps in this field and what can this group do and is capable of moving forward. Then the second meeting happened about a month later, um, and that was for to send us as Canadians off to Edinburgh and start to meeting those groups in person. So one of the persons that's a mention that was involved throughout that entire event was Agnes Houston. And Agnes, her voice was amazing being able to hear her experiences of living with dementia and getting lost in her community um, in Scotland. And again, this group's very similar. We're just trying to figure out what, what are we capable of, what is out there, and what can we do for this group? And then one final one, because we felt, hey, wherever we are, we might as well try to arrange some of these meetings and just get to know each other a little bit more and further establish our group. Um, we received, I received funding through the Alzheimer's Society of Ontario with a project that I did with them. They sent me to this International Missing Persons Conference in Liverpool uh, last month. And so I was uh, blessed to be able to run a little bit of a smaller meeting, but we had others from Sweden that we didn't get to meet in person yet. Um, we had Elaine Wiersma. We also had individuals from Pur uh, the Purple Alert were all there. So again, it's just more conversations kept going. So finally, after those three meetings, we now have an idea of where we're, what we're up to. Um, and 
the cool thing though as well with the consortium is other than us having these meetings and trying to figure out what we're capable of doing what we really wanted to focus on was really encouraging the aspect of having experiences and getting to know each other even more so we always tried to arrange dinners or different meetings afterwards so we could really just sit down and get to know each other and really see how our different groups can come to come together so on the left hand corner that was all of us going out for dinner um, in Calgary and fortunately we were able to get funding to be able to cover some of these meals and even for Roger that lived three hours away from Calgary we were able to cover his expenses to come so we did have that kind of funding to be able to let them have these different types of experiences. So pretty much now what I'm going to speak about is about different topics that have been coming up with the consortium and of course the first one I've been trying to allude to it over the last little bit is this concept of wandering. Um, so as researchers pretty much if I do not speak of wandering um, when I publish something they have no idea what I'm talking about. However, I know in the community, um, I know in Canada, we're not as strong against as wandering, but I know in Australia and as well as I know in the UK, people don't even use the term just because there is a massive stigma that's associated with it. And the reason why um, we find that there's a stigma around this, as, as in the consortium I've been speaking of, is that it's assumed to be an aimless behavior. People think that that's that's what it is. So if they're walking with the purpose, then it's not wandering. And so there's that stigma that ends up attaching itself. And so the problem, though, is that within the literature, it's we use wandering, but really we're getting at this aspect of getting lost. Wandering is fine. It's just, you can go on, out into the community. You can have a purposeful walk, but really it's their transition from wandering to getting lost. The getting lost piece is what we're concerned of. This is when you're at risk of getting of injuries happening, of something happening to you. So really what we had to learn is that there's, there is a confusion and how can we get around from further educating people and understanding that it's this getting lost aspect, this wayfinding piece that we as researchers and as this group want to focus on. And so really though, the, the key piece is, is how do we get away from this stigma? Um, do we need to be able to come up with another term for wandering? So this is something that's actually going to turn into one of the main outcomes of the consortium is can we come up with an international term that everyone's okay with. So who knows, maybe wayfinding is, but we haven't confirmed that yet. And can we have a definition that's attached to it and even have it as part of WHO and other organizations so we can really start to use one terminology instead of us using all these different types of terms and being afraid of what is stigmatized and what is not. Um, so stay tuned for this piece because um, this is on our radar that we're hoping on starting to further address um, this fall. And we plan on doing this by, um, during my doctoral thesis, in fact, I Ask people questions on wandering what they thought of it and so I plan on using that and asking the same questions in other countries and really seeing what we can do so then the next piece is taking this aspect of stigma um, I started to discuss this already um, and we've had this, these conversations in the consortium is trying to find this balance between independence and safety Again, as I mentioned, it's, we're so afraid of getting lost, it's so negative, but it's, a lot of times it's associated with blocks and barriers. And so this Goldilocks principle and dimension wayfinding, it's something that I actually developed um, during my thesis. And it's just was something to try to demonstrate of looking at strategies that are just right. So for example, if you do not see the risk of getting lost, which it's, it's, it tends to be something we don't want to speak about, so it tends to stay in the back burner, then the person with dementia, they have all the independence in the world, which is great, but then if there's no strategy in place, then unfortunately if something happens, then all of a sudden they'll rebound from no risk perception at all and having all the independence in the world, so people tend to go on the opposite end of the spectrum, where now all of a sudden, especially the care partners, they see the risk of that person with dementia getting lost as something that's so high, they feel that the only solution out there is to lock them up. And so how can we have this balance between independence and safety? How can we promote proactive strategies that let us have a mix of both of these? So this is a very complex question, and again, this is something that the consortium wants to look at moving forward. I know that the Goldilocks had actually proposed it during our Edinburgh meeting, um, and it seems to be a cool way of doing it. However, again, as we all know with international, I know what Goldilocks is. Um, those in the UK and Australia know what Goldilocks is, but other countries don't necessarily know who Goldilocks and the three bears are. So perhaps an outcome within the consortium is, is can we come up with a term that's really easy for people to pick up on, for perhaps from a teaching from our, from our childhood that we can further identify with trying to find this balance. Another key piece that is coming from the consortium, and again, it's showing the importance of having this knowledge mobilization platform, is that I developed a series of guidelines as part of my thesis. 
Um, so as we can see on this slide here, um, I created three different versions. Um, one you see for persons living with dementia, I have one for care partners in the community, and then I also have one for care facilities. And essentially what I ended up doing was is I wanted to focus on this Goldilocks principle. Can I promote different strategies that people can use to become active agents in their own care while still having that degree of autonomy and independence? So essentially what you can see is that you end up having what would put someone with dementia at risk of getting lost. And then underneath that, I have proactive strategies. And essentially these guidelines weren't just developed from me. Um, I really followed something called a participatory approach. So persons with dementia, community organizations and care partners, Ron Bellino and Roger Marple are, are two of them that have been involved in this work, are really guiding me along the right way of making sure that this is something that doesn't contribute to the stigma, that it helps with the discussion of getting away from this aspect of locked dementia units. And with persons living with dementia, something that the consortium likes and they want to look at it moving forward is having more things for individuals with dementia. It's too many times that we see guidelines and tools for care partners and we always end up forgetting about those with dementia. And the key thing and the really interesting thing is with these strategies that you see on this slide, there is no research currently that involves strategies specifically for persons with dementia to use. So all these strategies that are involved in these guidelines are actually from those in the community in Canada that are actually using them. So Roger's voice and what the strategies he uses, among others, have been included in this um, as success stories or things that were successful for them. And of course, I'm hoping that I can further move that moving forward. One final piece before I move on to the next, um, next aspect is that we've also put in messaging, and again, the consortium approves of this, and they want to be able to see this, is understanding that we need to be able to apply education and proactive strategies as soon as possible to encourage safe wandering. And it's, I know that it might end up causing people to cringe with the use of wandering, but I'm trying to find ways as to how we can get people to understand that wandering, being able to go in the community, um, and perhaps an international definition, once we have it with the consortium, can be replaced with wandering, just encouraging that people can go out in the community and be able to live a life a bit better. Um, so, now, essentially what we see here on the back um, side is, is that we end up having a list of available strategies. And so the list of available strategies um, is essentially where people can click on links so the guidelines became a one-stop shop. And the plan is that the consortium is going to try to move them into different international um, groups, maybe the UK, um, Katie mentioned that they might be interested in using them. So now moving on, that was only a couple aspects. We talked about wandering terminology, the consortium was interested in guidelines. Then the next piece is alert systems that I already alluded to. So what I have learned, so we see that CASAP that, uh, that Ron Bellino is uh, the founder of. And then there's also ones around the world that are happening. There's the purple alert. Um, there's safe, uh, purple alerts from Scotland. There's also safe land that they're using in Sweden. Very similar aspects of talking about the silver alert system, but they work differently based on the governments or based on the jurisdictions that they're in. So the consortium is curious to see, can we have certain ones and seeing if one size fits for this country, perhaps it might fit for another country. So for example, in Canada, we have to go through the police. They refuse to send off an alert unless the police are involved. Purple alert, they just go right to the community because the police don't want to become involved. So it's kind of cool because we can end up taking some of these and being able to help assist it and put it into other countries that are interested in it rather than completely recreating the wheel for every country that wants to have their own alert system. And so now for the consortium itself, so um, as I mentioned, we had different outcomes that we're looking at. Um, so now how do we be able to encourage more knowledge exchange? How do people talk to each other? So luckily again, AgeWell gave us money. Um, and so we have been working on a website um, and it hasn't been launched yet. It's gonna be launched in about September um, once things are done. But pretty much you end up having two different um, ways of being able, be able to get in. If you're not a member of the consortium, you can go in and you can actually see different resources um, that researchers have suggested as part of the consortium or even community organizations. You have biographies, contact information if you're interested in research, um, as well as we're planning on trying to have a fairly regular blog just so people can see what, is, what the consortium has been up to. But in addition to this, something that's kind of cool is that we're going to have um, the consortium member portal. So essentially people can go online if you're a member and would end up having areas where you can actually post questions or if you're interested in something. So it's really trying to promote people having a conversation with each other, meeting each other, and hopefully seeing other projects that could stem off of this. Um, so again, stay tuned for that. Um, and really for the involvement of the consortium, it just became as flexible as what people wanted to. If they wanted a voice and opinion, great. But if they wanted to become more involved, then that has an opportunity for them as well. 
So just a few impact statements. Again, I know I don't have a whole lot because it's we're very young, um, but um, I love Roger's uh, comment that he had on Twitter where essentially he ended up saying that um, here's a group I recommend keeping an eye on. The International Consortium on Dementia and Wayfinding, gaining a lot of steam across the world, full focus on keeping people with dementia safe from getting lost. And um, one of our Joe Apps, who actually ends up running the missing persons in the UK, um, he ended up stating this on our consortium. So he said the consortium, with its inter in international reach, has great potential to produce and mobilize knowledge around dementia and wayfinding for the benefit of not just UK policing, but policing worldwide. Already, our central missing persons unit in the National Crime Agency has increased its understanding of dementia thanks to the consortium. And we look forward to a great future together, translating its research knowledge into operational practice. And then from Jamie Sterling, who is also another officer in Canada, he had stated that the International Consortium has not only removed the global geographic boundaries, but has also connected the tra traditional silos of research, technology, and public safety. So again, this is exciting considering we're fairly new, so I'm hoping that we'll be able to have more impact statements that we'll be able to share as this group further um, moves, moves forward. So, now, the consortium, where are we planning on moving forward? So, it's, of course, the first aspect is we need to launch a website. You can't do much unless you have a website that's ready to go. Um, and then also, there's going to be another meeting um, at the International Conference on Law Enforcement and Public Health in Edinburgh, UK. Um, and that one's more so we have a couple of our Ottawa Police Service. They're planning on flying out. We're going to have other officers, and they're going to have more so like an officer-based meeting, but they're going to learn from each other and best, best practices um, when trying to deal with a uh, person with dementia that has gone missing. And they're also going to involve other researchers in that. So while I can't fly there in person, I'll be there by Zoom, so the joys of this type of technology. Um, we also will have a special issue um, in dementia. So Elaine Wiersma, um, she is one of the editors of that. So they have, we're planning on having um, a special edition on that, just talking about this issue of wayfinding and getting lost and really trying to show people where we're at and where we need to move on. And um, we also um, have the consortium, we're looking at it becoming an international hub for strategies and partnerships. Can people begin to take on other strategies and implement them in other parts of the world? However, as you remember on that map, as I had mentioned earlier, is that it's really focused on Europe and North America right now. And so, of course, we know that we need to involve Australia even more, other than just Brisbane, or um, yeah, other than just Brisbane. And then we need to involve Asia, because I know that there's a lot of really cool stuff that's going on in some of the aspects, such as Hong Kong. Um, so we're hoping on looking at having other collaborations for that and we're looking for a potential area to be able to do that So Singapore, I know that um, Dai is hosting that perhaps that could be a group that we end up sending people to um, So they can attend uh, that conference and then go to a consortium meeting However, anyone that's in the audience that's interested and knows how to involve other countries again It's me just graduating and finishing my PhD I'm more than willing to have any other feedback as to how we can involve other audiences in this field so that is that for the presentation itself. Um, so really, I just wanna now open up to a conversation. I know it was a lot of information, um, so feel free to ask me questions or even comments um, on this topic in general. Thank you.